morning, I just want to share some thoughts with you. Um, and they come out of the life of King David. Now, if you don't have a lot of Bible knowledge, um, I want you to know it's okay. It was a, he's a king in an Old Testament um, of God's people. And he is a king that all other kings became uh, measured by. King David, um, you know, God selected, had anointed for this. As a child, as he grew, he became king um, after King Saul. And so King David, um, great shepherd, um, he uh, had some great victories. He was a passionate person. He was a bold person. He was a worshiper of the Lord. In fact, it is said about him in the Scripture that he had a heart that was after God. And yet, here's the beauty. Um, not that, he, um, that he sinned. Was that me? Did I do? That was you? Okay. Um, I thought, man, is my pack starting to go? And my sound is going in and out. I want to change batteries. Um, so, <clears throat> it's, the beauty is not that he sinned but that the Bible doesn't leave out the humanity of David because we look at him and he's kind of a hero of the faith in a lot of ways, some great things to emulate. But it also includes the facts of his life, not, not all of them, but we get a glimpse um, into this anointed, selected, chosen man of God who sinned. And there were repercussions of his sin. Now, we know that David, because we read about him in the Bible, that he came to a place where he confessed his sin to God. He asked forgiveness. He changed and didn't continue sinning. And, you know, he humbled himself before the Lord. And, you know, he came to grips with his sin and confessed it and goes on. But because of those sins, there were some ramifications that took place. And, you know, as great a man of God as he was and leader that he, he was and the accomplishments that he did for, for God's people, um, his household, his personal household, it, was a, it became a mess. And I want us to look at this a little bit. Because I want us to, I want to come to the understanding in my own life and, and for you to, to say, you know, God's promises and his covenant to us is based upon who he is. Not based upon who I've been. Because if I look at who I've been, man, I'll find, you know, sin, I'll find unworthiness, I'll find all kinds of flaws, um, those that I didn't mean to be, you know, flaws, they're just weaknesses, and then other things that I willfully did wrong. I mean, you know, you have the same list, okay? I mean, your list might vary, but it's the same kind of list. And so here's David with a similar kind of list, but, you know, let's just glance at a few things that took place in his life. Because God still made a covenant and a promise to him, and God kept it. And it wasn't just based upon David's performance. It was based upon who God is, his virtue, his nature. You know, we can look at things that happen in this life, and we can feel like we put God under the microscope and scrutinize him because he didn't do what we expected or how we want, or we see some injustices go on. And, and, and so we, you know... We come up with our way of thinking about it, and this makes sense to me, and therefore, you know, this is how I'm going to believe, and I'm going to do self-preservation, and I think I got it all figured out, and, and we just fall into some of our own arrogance, and we can deceive ourselves based on little snapshots and our deduction of it, which isn't purely truth. And so we, you know, we get off the mark. And I want you to know that God's covenant and promises are based on who He is, not who we've been. He, I want you to hear this. You can have a scathed past, not so perfect, 
And when you and I humble ourselves and come before the Lord and ask forgiveness, and we mean it with sincerity, it's not just come forgive me, clean my conscience for a moment, and then I can go back to my filth or the way I'm living or my own you know, arrogance. Know that from that point we pursue to follow him and we change. And that kind of repentance, that we discover his grace and mercy and we discover that he is a, a person who keeps his promises, not like people who have broken promises. That For many of us, of, of us, we carry the ramifications of that. We've evolved around that kind of hurt and we've tried to figure out a way to cope and we've developed some attitudes along the way that really are not godly but you know we've just tried to do the best we can without him and it's flawed and so here's David and I want you to look at his his past a little bit you know here he is this marvelous king accomplished lots but you know David committed adultery with Bathsheba She conceives. He has her husband basically murdered through uh, an act of war. Um, this child they have, it dies. I mean, it's just tragedy after tragedy. And the child dies, and now you think stuff's over. And God said, listen, you know, you looked for mercy and grace and you found it, but understand the sword is never going to leave your house because of some of these decisions you made, because of some of the choices you made. It has opened the door and unleashed some um, horrific things. You know, we have to keep in mind that, you know, our sin, we can call it ours, it can, it can come to the point where it affects the people around us. Our sin. You know, the, the, the heartache that we can cause our parents because of choices we made. I mean, you know, um, things we chose to do have affected other people. Not just the way they feel and think. It could have affected and altered their life and attitude and outlook. And there's a responsibility that we have in that. And we can't always go back and just fix that. Just like other people can't always go back and just fix um, the influence they've had on us by choices they've made. And so here's David, and he's going through his life here, and these things have unfolded. These are things he's done. I mean, understand, he had, a, you know, he had sons and daughters. Um, one of his sons' name was Amnon. Amnon had a half-sister, okay? Her name was Tamar. He was, he was just taken with her. And, and you'll find this, you know, if you, as you look in, in uh, second, uh, first, second Samuel, and, you know, you can find some of this in Kings. You know, you, here's, here's David's household. I mean, he has a son who is really taken with one of his uh, half-sisters. And it comes to the point where they, he and another, his friend, they devise a scheme, and he violates his half-sister. David finds out about this at some point. And David didn't do anything about it. Well, another one of David's sons named Absalom knew about this violation that Amnon forced himself upon Tamar, his sister. And Absalom waits for a time, devises a plan, gets a few other people involved, and and Absalom, you know, because he's observing that um, his father didn't do what maybe Absalom thought that he should do, and so Absalom comes to the point of great revengeance and anger and frustration, and he's going to take it. He's going to um, take out um, Amnon. He's going to take this whole situation into his own hands, and he kills Amnon at a later time because of what he did to his half-sister or Absalom's sister. I mean, this is what's going on in, you know, malice in the palace, so to speak. This is what's going on in, in the king's family. And you can go on and you can go through Scripture and find some other things that are happening. You know, now it comes to the point where if, if we look at 
2 Samuel in chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and I encourage you, if you read it this week, take some time and read it. And it goes through these, this very dark hour of David's life where now politically his throne is at risk because his son Absalom is going out and recruiting people, causing them to doubt David and gain favor with him that Absalom is now going to try to take the throne from his own father, and that doesn't even belong to him. And so David, you know, gets whiff of all this, gets reports of what's going on and how many people are starting to, you know, follow and show their allegiance to Absalom. And, and David's finding that some of his loyalties are, uh, that have been loyal to him have now, you know, forsaken him and are going with Absalom. And so David, with some of his family and with uh, those who were loyal, David goes on the run here. Now, this is his own son. These are the things that are going on. Now, I don't know the condition of your family or your background, the family you grew up in or the family that you've raised or are raising. And, you know, there can be some great and godly things that are going on in our life and and look right, and that God uses us, and God anoints us for things. But in our private world, there can be some very detrimental things, and tragedies, and, and, and sin, and flaws show up, and it doesn't matter if you have a title. And so this stuff is going on in David's life. And yet God has made a promise and a covenant to him. Now, here's the difference between King Saul, who was king before David, and David. Here's the difference between David and his son Absalom, who was trying to take the throne from David. So here you got three kings. Saul tried to keep the throne by deception, manipulation, and by murder. He tried to murder David on a couple of occasions because he found out and knew that David was anointed to be the next king. But God rejected Saul because Saul did not obey God. Saul even got involved in um, consulting and summoning the occult. And here he's the king of God's people. And God ripped the kingdom from him and gave it to another, gave it to David. And now... Absalom, he's trying to take the throne. I mean, David's caught in the middle here between a father-in-law and a son. And now a son who's trying to take the throne by manipulation, deceit, murder. It's all going on in his family. I don't know your family tree. I don't know if... uh, you can relate to some of this or say, well, it's not that extreme, but yeah, there's some stuff. Or, or maybe it's not family related, it's just people who are close in your life. And some of our sin and choices have, man, got this ball rolling. And now, you know, here's the difference between Saul and David. Is Saul wouldn't repent before God, but David did. Here's the difference between David and Absalom. Absalom is doing a few religious things for political motivations. Well, God sees that. And then Absalom does some overt things to try to take over the throne that are a complete violation of God. Had no regard for God. And here's David in the middle who has also sinned, but he had a regard for God and repented and has forgiveness and changed. And he found favor. See, I don't care what your history is. It can look like David's. And I want you to know that God is faithful to his word and to his promises, and they're not based upon your righteousness or my righteousness. Because frankly, I don't have very much righteousness on my own. In fact, none, to be honest. I was born in sin. I'm a sinner. Made mistakes. Just like you. And yet if we come to a place and understand that I can actually embrace the promises of God. You know, there's certain promises that were made 
here in, in the Bible that God made specifically to other people. Like um, the promise we're going to read in Psalm 89 that God made a covenant and a promise to David about um, him being king and his lineage and the throne. Well, I can't take that promise and make it mine because I'm not a king. But there are promises that are made to all of us in the Scripture. Promises that are made to you, covenants that God has made to those who come to faith in Him. And now I look at my past or the things that are in the private life, even though things outwardly could look very successful, privately we look at our lives and see failure and we feel shortcoming and it's like, I'm not worthy of those promises. How could I ever believe these promises that God would keep to me when I have been living a life with very little regard for God? Or I said, ah, God will forgive me, I'm just going to go do this or God is gracious, or God understands, or we use some experience in life as a license to live how we think rather than living and being free from that to live and become the person we ought to be in God because of his mercy. But David, he humbled himself. He didn't let his past rob him from believing that God was still going to keep his promises. You see, God's promises are based upon his nature, his virtue, not mine. You see, the promises that I made to my children were fulfilled because of my character, not because of theirs. Right? The promise is based upon the nature of the person giving the promise, not based upon the nature of the person who's the recipient. Now, there were granted, there were some things that were conditional. In other words, I will do this if you. And it wasn't manipulation, it was a kind of reward. If you get three A's on this next report card, I will give this to you. It was a reward. I promised to do that. Then there were things that we just promised that we would do whether they performed well or not. That promise was based upon my nature, my character, just like, just like in your life. The promises we break, they weren't based upon their performance. The promises we didn't keep showed up our true nature, that we were not promise keepers. We didn't do it. We didn't follow through. Well, I want you to know that the promises and the covenants of God that he has made with you are based upon his nature, not upon our flawed past. Now, we can feel unworthy, and how could he keep a promise when I've lived like this and done this? It's when we humble ourselves and have a regard for God, and we truly ask forgiveness, and we go through the process and we change, we will find a great favor and mercy with him. That's the difference between Saul and David and Absalom and David. David sinned greatly. And the ramifications of those sins affected the people around him. And it came back to bite his household, really. And so it was like the, these things of the past kept trying to, even the things that David was forgiven of, it's like they tried to come back and, you know, get him and get him distracted. You know how it is. You know how your past kind of chases you sometimes and catches up with you? Have you ever had that? You start to get down, you start to feel up, and we start to forget the promise that God has made for us. The promise that, I don't know, he went to the cross and shed his blood for my forgiveness. And that he gave favor to me that I don't deserve. And that if I believe upon him, I won't perish, but I'll know him and have everlasting life. And promises in this life that he won't forsake us or leave us. 
as we humble ourselves and show regard to him. And so all of the stuff is going on behind David's success as a king. And things are coming now that, that just pursue him and, and to, to trouble him. I mean, these are some dark hours. I mean, can you imagine being in David's sandals? I mean, some of you don't have to pretend to be in his sandals. The, the sandals and the shoes that you wear today, you're saying, man, there's stuff going on in, in my life uh, that's not tidy or in my family or the way I was raised, or the family I raised, or now my kids are this age or that age, and man, there's things I did do and there's things I didn't do as a parent or as an influence, or friendships and people around you that, you know, maybe we should have done some things different. And it comes back to kind of affect others and affect us, and we remember it, and all of a sudden we start feeling bad and it's like, how could God ever accept me? How could I ever go to him or claim and believe in his promises for me because I've just been so unworthy? Well, David's in that place, but David held on to a promise. And I'll tell you, if, if you were to look in 2 Samuel um, chapter 15, it talks about as he is in hiding, as Absalom is building his army in favor to come and get David and kill him so that he can become king and take the throne. There was a man who was a great counselor to David who had a great reputation and most of the time this man's counsel was right. His name was Ahithophel. And Ahithophel changed loyalties from David to Absalom. And Ahithophel became a counselor to Absalom. And David heard of this. And he knows that Ahithophel gives good counsel. And Absalom was saying, how can I assure that the throne will be mine? And Ahithophel comes up with this plan, how to assure it. And, it, and David prays. Now here's David who committed sins and had all kinds of flaws, but he, he repented. He made things right with God, even though his history, we can see all these terrible things. He found mercy in God and grace in God, and, and so he prayed to God. And he said, God, make Ahithophel's counsel, make it flawed, make it thwarted, because David knows that that man gives great counsel. But on this occasion, God, I ask that you would disqualify his counsel to Absalom. Now, here's the interesting thing about David. That, that was his request. You and I might do things a little different. We might come not just ask that in general, but come up with the plan of how it should happen, when it should happen, the way it should happen, all the details of what it should happen. No, David just prayed and he left it with God. David left it with God. He prayed it. In chapter 17, it says that Absalom asked another counselor Hushea. And he gave different counsel than a Thithophel. And Absalom abandoned eventually the plan of a Thithophel, went with the other counsel, thwarted his plan. So God heard David's prayer and answered. I want you to grasp this. This is what's important to us. That though we have a flawed past, when we come to God and humble ourselves, and we taste of his mercy and grace in our broken life, our messed up life, our family, our whatever it is. We can come to him and pray, and he will hear us. What hinders us from asking is when we measure our past, and we see how short we have fallen, and we don't feel worthy to ask. This is a God who has shown mercy and has shown grace. And he gives that grace to those who are humble and have a regard for him. And I want you to know that once again, we can come to him based on his character and virtue. If we look at our character and virtue, which isn't so great, and that's what we focus on, we will never approach God. And yet, God has made a way for us to come to him. 
You see, his promises are based on who he is, not on who we've been. And God hears David's prayer and answers. Things unfold. David remains king. Absalom dies in battle. David gets the news, and he's sorrowful. Here, the throne is still his, and Israel stays united under David. And yet he lost his own son, and it grieved him. But God's will and God's plan prevailed. I mean, you, you know, Daniel, the prophet in the Old Testament, said it this way, the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wills or wishes. But here's David with a flawed life and a messed up household because of his own sin, but repented and humbled himself before God. And I want to read you part of Psalm 89 because this is part of the promise and covenant that God made with David, even knowing that David was going to sin. Listen, you don't know all the words that are going to come out of your mouth later today or tomorrow if God gives you life that long or gives me life that long. But do you know he already knows it? Do we understand that when God called David as a boy and anointed him, when he had this, the, the prophet and priest Samuel anoint him as king, don't you already know that God knew that David would commit adultery? I want you to be encouraged. God calls people and all of us are broken. Our hearts are wicked and evil above all things, Scripture says. Now, we don't have to live under that gloom and doom. It's just we live under the beauty and the joy of that God has a grace and mercy that is better and greater than the evil within our hearts or within humanity. And he makes a way for us. That he anointed David and he knows that David would make this choice. But God still made a promise to him. And this was the promise in Psalm 89. God says, my covenant I will not violate, nor will I alter the utterance of my lips. I won't change what I've said. Once I have sworn by my holiness, in other words, by my nature, by my character, I will not lie to you, David. And God will not lie to you. His promises are yes, amen, final, for sure, unaltered, will not change his plan. His descendants shall endure forever, and his throne is the sun before me. He's talking about David here. And it shall be established forever like the moon, and the witness in the sky is faithful. As the sky keeps coming up, that faithfulness, God will have the same kind of faithfulness. To David. It wasn't based upon David's righteousness or unrighteousness. It was based upon good, God's good character. And I want us to grasp this morning that regardless of our past or what's been done to us or what we've done or how we've responded to life and its events and injustices to, or whatever it is, that if we will humble ourselves and have regard for God, there is a grace and mercy that comes to our life. When our past tries to pursue us, crush us, catch up to us, breed doubt that we can't go to God or turn to God or he'll reject us. It's just not the case. 